Howdy, folks. This is just a reminder that if you like this content, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. And be sure to hit the bell notification so you always get notified whenever I have a new video. Hope you enjoy this. In the last few days, there's been a bit of an uproar in media and social media accounts about recent comments that Pope Francis made. Because every religion is a way to arrive at God. And if you read what he says about interreligious dialogue in isolation from his emphasis on evangelization, it gives a very different impression. This is something that the early church fathers talked about. God has let little bits of truth about him appear in all these different religions, and they called them seeds of the gospel. But my strong impression is like they're looking for him to trip up. It's like, oh, that was imprecise. Oh, that, that could read a different way. Let's make this go viral now and see how bad the Holy Father is. And unfortunately, this is from a lot of Catholics. This isn't just concerns or questions. Jimmy Aiken, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much. My pleasure to be here. Thanks for joining. This is our first time having you on. I am an admirer of a lot of your work from afar. You, I know, make the rounds with Catholic Answers and a lot of podcasts day in and day out sharing the the real truth of the Catholic faith. I think there's a lot of misconceptions, so I appreciate your work. Thank you for that work. It's really important. For those that are not as familiar with your background, Jimmy would love to hear who's Jimmy Aiken and what's your background. Okay, well, um, so I'm an apologist, which is a person who defends something, and I'm a Christian apologist, so I defend the Christian faith, and I'm also a Catholic apologist, so I defend the Catholic understanding of the Christian faith. I work for an organization called Catholic Answers. Um, I'm the senior apologist there. In fact, I'm the senior employee. I've been doing apologetics for <laughs> over 30 years. In addition to that, I do a bunch of podcasts. I appear regularly every week on Catholic Answers Live, which is on between three and 400 terrestrial radio stations. I have a podcast called the Jimmy Aiken Podcast I just launched, and my most famous podcast is uh, Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World, where I look at mysteries of all different types from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. I love that. I'm sure you're familiar with Father Spitzer. Oh, yes. Father Robert Spitzer. Yeah, yeah. So you and him are up there doing that beautiful work. I, we're always fascinated on the show to learn about the scientific backing of even miracles and all of the evidence for our faith that can be found in the natural wor world and order. So thank you. It's very, very exciting stuff. And we'll link your uh, some of your work in the description so folks can find you. But listen, Jimmy, as you know, in the last few days, there's been a bit of an uproar in media and among social media accounts about recent comments that the Holy Father made, Pope Francis mm -hmm. made. And these were comments, as is my understanding, at an interfaith uh, assembly of young people. I think it was in Singapore. Yes. And so there is a group of them talking, and the Holy Father made some comments that people found very confusing. So I'm very excited that you're here to help us unpack these comments and talk about what it means. So we're going to start with listening to what the Holy Father said, now, as folks know that there's a catch because the Holy Father was not speaking in English and he was also not speaking, uh, he was not also not being translated, I think, initially into English. Give us a little bit of the background of this interfaith gathering, if, if, you, if you would, Jimmy. Well, it's uh, part of the Pope's most recent uh, international trip or apostolic vo voyage, as they call them. Here, he went to a number of different countries in Southeast Asia, one of one of them being Singapore. And Pope Francis sometimes will he'll have texts that are prepared for him ahead of time. Uh, but sometimes he just sets those aside and talks off the top of his head. And so that's what he did in this occasion. He had a prepared speech to read to these young people, but he got all enthused about he's talking to these young people and he really wants to connect with them. And so he decided to set aside his prepared remarks and just give some off the cuff reflections. And this is something that, you know, popes periodically do. I remember once when uh, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth was preparing to baptize some people, and he just set aside his remarks and talked directly from his heart. So this is not unusual for popes to do. Uh, but popes have different skill levels in terms of phrasing themselves precisely when they're uh, speaking off the top of their heads. And that isn't always one of Pope Francis's strengths. He, when he gets off script and just speaks off the top of his head or off the cuff, he sometimes says things that reflect the truth, but also 
reflected in an incomplete way, and that's led to a number of incidents where there's been confusion. In this case, one of the things that he didn't uh, express was the role of evangelization or sharing the gospel with people. Now, Pope Francis knows all about sharing the gospel with people. In fact, that's one of the key priorities of his papacy is evangelization. In fact, the very first document that he issued as pope, that he wrote, is called Evangelii Gaudium, which means the joy of the gospel. And it's all about evangelizing people and sharing the, the gospel of Jesus Christ with them and helping them become Christians and so forth. So he's very well aware of the priority of evangelization. But what he did here was he didn't mention that, and instead he focused on interreligious dialogue. And if you read what he says about interreligious dialogue in isolation from knowing about his emphasis on evangelization, it gives a very different impression. And so I think it's important in, uh, in looking at these comments to realize these are comments being made from someone who is thoroughly committed to evangelization. So they're not giving you the whole picture of what he thinks on this subject. It's just a partial selection of truths. Let's do this. Let's pull up the transcript of the remarks. I'm just going to read this and correct me if this sounds wrong, but this is from the Vatican themselves. So this is their translation. Mm -hmm. He says, this is very important because if you start arguing, my religion is more important than yours or mine is true. Yours is not true. Where does this lead? Somebody answer. And then one of the young people said destruction. Holy Father says, that is correct. All religions are paths to God. I will use an analogy. They are like different languages that express the divine, but God is for everyone. And therefore we are God's, we are all God's children, but my God is more important than yours. This is this true. There is only one God and religions are like languages, paths to reach God. Some Sikh, some Muslim, some Hindu, some Christian understood interfaith dialogue among young people takes courage and then he goes on to speak about the importance of dialogue and the courage to have that dialogue so what people are really upset about understandably so is it sounds confusing to say that all religions are paths to god and that they are like different languages that express the divine we know and we know i know the holy father knows and this is the official teaching of the church that there is only uh, Jesus Christ is the true God. Um, there is one God and the church, it is through Jesus Christ and his church that people reach self, it, it, it receive salvation. Mm -hmm. So help us unpack this and why what the Holy Father is saying is actually not heresy, um, but that it's misunderstood here, His what mm -hmm. he's uh, getting at with his words. Yeah, I think it's helpful to kind of back up one sentence to get the beginning of the paragraph where he says this, where he introduces the topic, because it frames the issue, and then kind of take it piece by piece and say, what's he trying to communicate here? Mm -hmm. So he begins this part of the discussion by saying, one of the things that has impressed me most about the young people here in, in Singapore is your capacity for interfaith dialogue. So that's the topic. He's talking about interfaith dialogue, which is something we need to have. You know, that's even part of evangelization is having conversations with people of other faiths and learning about theirs so you can learn how to more effectively share Jesus Christ with them. So the topic here is interfaith dialogue. And then what he goes on to say is about how we conduct interfaith dialogue. And that's where he says this, meaning interfaith dialogue, is very important because if you start arguing, my religion is more important than yours, or mine is the true one, yours is not true, where does that lead? He asks a question, invites someone to answer, someone answers destruction, and he says that's correct. So what he's pointing out here is that when you do interfaith dialogue, you don't just want to get into arguments. It's, it's argument that he's focusing on here as unhelpful. That's different than dialogue. He's all in favor of talking to people of other religions. What he's not in favor of is getting into destructive arguments or arguments that lead to destruction. He then says all religions are paths to God. Well, there's an element there that's true. You know, St. Paul, for example, in his uh, discussion at the Areopagus in Acts chapter 17, acknowledged that the Greeks 
were seeking God in their religion. And he says, I found an altar dedicated to an unknown God. You know, they recognized there's probably a God we're not worshiping and we ought to worship him. So they made an altar to an unknown God. St. Paul says, what you worshiped in ignorance, I now proclaim to you. And he then goes on to quote Greek poets who were regarded by the Greeks as divinely inspired. And he quotes, you know, how uh, God is near to each of us and um, God made us so that we might seek after him and perhaps find him. And he's quoting these pagan authors to make these points. So St. Paul acknowledged that even a religion as, as bad as the Greek one with all its polytheistic gods was a way of trying to strive after God and grow closer to God. So that's true. And, and that's what the Pope is saying here. All religions are paths to God in that sense. That doesn't mean they're all going to get you to an accurate understanding of God, but they're a way to seek after God. And then he says, I'll use an analogy. They are like different languages that express the divine. Okay, well, there's an element of truth there, too. Just like St. Paul indicated, the Greeks had some truths about God that they expressed in their way. But now he's going to go on to complete that with an understanding from a Christian perspective. But you could still say, yeah, different religions have insights about God, and they express them in their own ways, so they are kind of like languages. This is uh, something that the early church fathers in the very early Christian centuries talked about. They didn't use this analogy, but they used another one where they said, God has let little bits of truth about him appear in all these different religions, and they called them seeds of the gospel. So that was the metaphor they use, not languages, but seeds. So you've got all these seeds that God has planted in these other religions that then can be used to help them understand the fullness of truth. So there is an element of truth here. You know, he's not he's not he's not being heretical. He's not contradicting the Christian faith. Uh, he would be contradicting the Christian faith if he went on to say stuff like, and it doesn't matter what religion you are, and Christianity is no better than Buddhism or Hinduism. But he doesn't say things like that. Instead, he's focusing on elements that are true. You know, religions do seek after God, and they do have insights that they express in different languages. Um, but he says God is for everyone, and therefore we are all God's children which now, of course, Christians are children of God in a special way because we've been adopted. But there is a sense in which God as our creator can be envisioned as our heavenly father. Um, he then says, speaking in the voice of you know someone doing religious dialogue the wrong way, he says, but my God is more important than yours. And he, so here we have someone who's conceptualizing people as having fundamentally different gods, one of which is better than others. But he says, there is only one God, you know, so that's really, even no matter how you conceptualize it, there is only one God. And so if you're striving after God, that's what you're striving after, the one God that really does exist. So he says, there is only one God and religions like languages Path, are like languages, paths to reach God. Then he named some specific religions. He said some are Sikhs, which is a religion in Asia, some Muslim, some Hindu, some Christian. And then he asks, understood. And then he says, uh, yet interfaith dialogue among young people takes courage. And he goes on to talk about the value of courage and encourages the children to move forward with confidence in dialogue. And that's all he says on this subject. So he, you know, it's an incomplete picture because he's not talking about the importance of evangelization. But he, what he focuses on, the things he does say actually contain truths. They're not framed as precisely as maybe Pope Benedict would have mm -hmm. framed them, but they're fundamentally the same in substance. Thank you, Jimmy. I think that's a great analysis. I, it's always surprising to me. I guess I shouldn't be surprised by this, but when there are these, you know, very short snippets of the Holy Father's comments, whether it's in the media interview or in this address to these, you know, young people, and the thing that goes viral is perhaps the one that has the least context, mm. right? Um, or maybe there was, you know, some imprecise language that you know may be confusing to people. 
But the people that seem to be pushing these clips from the Holy Father, I mean, my strong impression, and I don't mean to read their hearts because I can't, but my strong impression is like they're looking for him to trip up. It's like, oh, that mm -hmm. was imprecise. Oh, that that could read a different way. Let's make this go viral now and see how bad the Holy Father is. And unfortunately, this is from a lot of Catholics. This isn't just, you know, concerns or questions coming from Protestants. This is from Catholics. Have you observed this in your work, Jimmy? And what is your take on this? I, I, I see it as sort of a phenomenon that seems to keep happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's a real phenomenon. And unfortunately, and to our shame, it is a phenomenon that occurs in some Catholic circles. There are some, there's a lot of influencers of all different types online, and many of them kind of have their shtick as being outrage and, you know, a, just a constant diet of negativity and looking down on other people, which is frankly not spiritually healthy. And some of them are on are Catholics, and particularly on the more traditional end of Catholicism, who do that with Pope Francis. And there are entire channels, you know, on YouTube and other places by Catholics that are that have as a regular part of their broadcast day, mm -hmm. let's look down on Pope Francis and let's scour over everything he said, interpreted it in the least favorable light, and then ginning up outrage and getting clicks. You know, this is outrage clickbait. And it's not healthy, and it's not helpful. And if you step back and say, okay, what do we know about this guy? Let's read him in context, and let's say, see if we can figure out what he's trying to say it's not nearly what the outrage critics will mm -hmm. will say but this is something that happens with everyone who's a prominent figure it happens with the pope it happens with presidents it happens mm -hmm. with leaders of other countries unfortunately this is kind of the media environment we're living in right now i think some of what underpins that you know maybe you could call it clickbait culture you know outrage culture is mm -hmm. fear and some of it's very understandable mm -hmm. fear because you know and i'm kind of playing devil's advocate here but I know, you know, some of these people, I, I think I, I can see your uh, horns growing. <laughs> I, I, I feel like I you know, know some of these people you're referencing, I'm referencing. And, you know, I do think there's some good intentions there. It's not like they're all just out, you know, yes, they, you know, the outrage headline gets more clicks typically, but they also feel like their responsibility is to, you know, call the whole, the wayward Holy Father to account and that they are, you know, mm. essential to helping protect the pure doctrine of the church. I do think that that is a motivating factor for some of these folks. And, you mm -hmm. know, and, and and what I like to say here, and one of the reasons I became Catholic after many years of study and learning about the faith, and I'm still learning, of course, is that the gates of hell will not prevail. You know, if God forbid mm -hmm. the Holy Father were to apostatize or just to go completely the route of heresy, then he God would remove him from his seat. I think this, you know, in the history of the papacy, this has happened where ultimately the church, you know, the, has been protected. The Pope speaking, uh, you know, from the seat of Peter on issues of, you know, matters of faith and morals to the whole group of, you know, Christians, Christendom, has never altered church teaching in a way, uh, you know, in, in, in to, to contradict uh, what has been revealed that has could contradict what we know to be true, that has not happened, even though we've had some popes who weren't necessarily the, the best guys, you know, ever. So mm -hmm. that has given me tremendous um, confidence. But, you know, what what is your, your take on that, you know, that fear that a lot of, you know, good people have, that in the modern world with all the relativism that we're seeing, you know, the, the church is going to somehow betray its own mandate? Well, um, I think that, you know, we do live in times that have risk and danger, and it's reasonable to be concerned about that. Um, actually, though, if you study church history, which a lot of people haven't, you find out, oh, they had just as big a problems in the old days as we do today. And really? so even though, yeah, even though, yes, we're, we're living in a time that has dangers, they were living in times that had dangers too. And yet God has guided the church through that. And so, and that gives one confidence looking at all the problems God has guided the church through in the past. Well, he'll guide us through the problems we have today too. Unfortunately, a lot of the influencers in this area don't really help people understand that. They're focused on 
this is the biggest problem ever, and they don't put it in historical context, and rather than helping people be serene and trusting in God to help guide the church amid difficulties, they are actually fostering panic, mm. and it's it's not helpful for their audience to do that. It's one thing to say, I have concerns here, and I think this could be better expressed, and we need to be aware of this issue. But it's another thing to just systematically build in mistrust of not the Holy Father, but of the Holy Spirit working through the church and the Holy Father. So um, so I think there's an element of destruction there that people need to take into account when they see some of these headlines. It's just like the media, you know, the secular media sensationalizes everything it can and pits everything and tries to frame it as a battle between liberal and conservative and stuff. And, uh, and there are influencers in the Catholic world who do the same thing. But the better sources are the ones that step back, and try to accurately report what's going on without trying to frame it as a the ultimate ideological death match. <laughs> there is, uh, I've, I saw one uh, commentator online reference St. Catherine of Siena, and the mm -hmm. fact that she, as a young woman, went out and spoke out against, uh, to be clear, she didn't speak out against the Pope per se. She wrote letters to the Holy Father at the time, urging him to change course on a matter she felt was incredibly important. And so they say, well, the saints did this. You know, the saints uh, called out the Holy Father, so why can't I? What would be your take on that? Well, um, so what St. Catherine of Siena did was, as you say, write letters, and that's following Jesus's uh instruction in Matthew 18 to try to solve problems on the lowest level possible. What St. Catherine of Siena did not do is go on YouTube and start trash talking him in public. So if you want to write letters to the Holy Father and give him advice on on how he should conduct affairs in the church, that's you're not only welcome to do that, that is your right, mm -hmm. because canon law s protects the right of even the lay faithful to advise the church's pastors on what they see as the spiritual needs of the church, as long as they do so respectfully. So if you want to write respectful letters, go <laughs> for it, you know, but that's different than going on the internet and trash talking your holy father. You know, honor thy father and mother is one of the Ten Commandments, and that applies to our spiritual fathers as well as our biological fathers. You know, there's that moment in um, Genesis after the flood where um, Noah has planted a vineyard and he's made wine and he's gotten drunk and he's gotten naked while he's drunk. And one of his, uh, one of his, descendants canaan you know sees him naked and then gets goes out and starts talking about it and trash talking noah and two of his faithful sons walk go in and walk backwards and lay a blanket over him and cover the nakedness mm -hmm. of their father so and and then when noah sobers up he curses canaan for what he did well frankly um you know what you want to do is cover the nakedness mm -hmm. of your father even if it's your spiritual father, you want to have that decency. Now, that doesn't mean never criticizing, but it does mean being respectful and having a sense of proportion. And that is something that a lot of folks aren't doing today. Such a good point, Jimmy. And I think it's one that, you know, again, I wasn't raised Catholic, but I watched this unfold and I'm so fiercely thankful for the office of the Pope for the papacy. I mean, this has just been such a blessing that the Lord has given us, you know, first to St. Peter and then through all of our amazing popes since. And of course, many of them, all of them are sinners. Um, all of them have mm -hmm. fallen short of the glory of God, as have I. And especially in, in such a the hot seat of, you know, traveling the world as Pope Francis does and speaking frequently on these issues, he's going to mess up. I mean, even some of the mm -hmm. best apologists, I think, mess up, and that's not his natural gig anyways, is to be an apologist. You know, he's a he's a shepherd. He's not so much first and foremost a preacher. And so anyways, I I, I, um, I really appreciate your perspective on this because I think it, it's one that needs to be shared, not to say that every glitch or mistake is not a glitch mm -hmm. or a mistake, but that we owe, we owe a, a prayer and loyalty uh, to our, to our mm -hmm. Holy Father. Uh, listen, I want to ask you about 
the, what the catechism teaches about other religions, because I think this is really important. Mm-hmm. You know, we, you were talking earlier about what the Holy Father was kind of getting at, and you know, I do know that the church teaches that it's only through Jesus Christ and his church that we are saved. It's not that there's some other path. You can't, yep. you don't get through he- to heaven through Buddha, <laughs> you know, that's not even under, right. you know, in, in, in the debate here. So what does the catechism say about how, in Holy Scripture, about how we should view other religions? Mm-hmm. Well, there are a variety of sources here. You know, the Gospels and St. Paul have information about this, and it's expressed in various church documents. Recently, the Second Vatican Council addressed this subject in its document Lumen Gentium, which means Light of the Gentiles. And then the Catechism draws principally on Scripture and on Lumen Gentium. And basically, it acknowledges Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father but through him. So if you end up in heaven, it's because of Jesus Christ. And the normal way we get to heaven is by embracing the faith of Jesus Christ, becoming a Christian, specifically becoming a Catholic, um, and, uh, and living the Christian life. But... The church also acknowledges, and this is something that has deep roots in the church, it goes back to the age of the church fathers, that there are people who are innocently unaware of the truth of the Christian faith and the truth of the Catholic faith. And if you're innocently unaware of those truths, then God's not going to hold you accountable for them. Uh, He's understanding of what you do know and what you don't know. And so if you don't, through no fault of your own, if you don't understand the the truth of the Christian faith, then God will still be willing to forgive you as long as you live up to what you do know. So if you otherwise cooperate with his grace, and if you otherwise, you know, uh, try to do his will, then you will end up be saved. God will forgive you for your sins. This is the same principle that was used to save Jewish people before the time of Christ. They didn't know the Messiah was Jesus of Nazareth and that he was going to die on a cross and they needed to be baptized. They didn't know any of those things. But yet they were seeking God. They were trying to do God's will as they understood it. They wanted his forgiveness. They asked for his forgiveness. And even though they were unaware of the truth of Jesus, God still saved them. And in, and on the same principle, God can save anybody today as long as they're genuinely living up to what they understand the truth to be in good conscience. Now, if someone knows the truth of the Christian faith, and I don't mean has heard the, about the Christian faith, because everybody's heard about it. Um, there's, a, you know, just because you've heard something doesn't create an obligation to believe it. I mean, if you are on a desert island and a man evangelizes you and he tells you that uh, pigs live in trees, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and that water is made out of fire, well, he did tell you the truth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, but he told it to you in a context that didn't give you any reason to believe him because the other two things he said are patently false. So... um So, you know, merely having heard the Christian faith is not enough. But if you've seen enough evidence to know that the Christian faith is true and you just refuse to accept it, well, then you're refusing salvation on the terms God is offering it. And that's when you do endanger your soul. But if you're an innocent as a non-Christian, you know, you were just always raised a Hindu or whatever – And you're otherwise trying to do what you believe to be true and, you know, seek after the divine, then God knows that you're seeking after him. You've just got some limitations because of how you were raised, and he's not going to hold that against you. He can still save you through his son, Jesus Christ. And you'll find out that's how you were saved when you get to heaven. So there is, I think, misunderstanding on this or a debate on this, of course, especially from mm-hmm. our Protestant brothers and sisters. I think some yeah. of them, you know, point to exam- as an example in Romans 10, it says uh, that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And he goes yep. on to say, it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. There is mm-hmm. a belief I know among many very faithful and sincere Protestants that you must profess the name of Jesus with your lips as with your heart in order to be saved. What's your take on that? 
Well, um, a couple of things. Number one, if that's an absolute requirement, then all Jews before the time of Jesus were damned because they didn't do that. So this is obviously not an absolute. I mean, King David would be damned because he didn't do that. So this is obviously not an absolute requirement. Also, Paul's talking to Christians, people who've already done this. So he's explaining to them, this is how you're saved. And it's the normal way of salvation, but that doesn't mean it's the only way. I would point to an earlier passage in Romans where St. Paul is talking about how the law of God is written on the hearts of men, even Gentiles, meaning non-Christians, because he says those who do not have the law, meaning the law of Moses. So these are non-Christian Gentiles who don't have the law of Moses, don't know about it. They've got the law of God written on their hearts, which is why they have consciences and debate about is this the right thing to do or not. And St. Paul says in that context that their hearts may excuse them on the day when God judges the secrets of men. So he envisions the possibility, at least this is a plausible reading of the text, he envisions the possibility of non-Christian Jews being excused on the day of judgment because they tried to live up to their conscience. There is another passage um, in Holy Scripture, John three five. I know you're, mm-hmm. you know, you know this. Jesus answered them, "Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God." So this is often used as evidence uh, among many, again, well, very sincere Protestants or evangelicals that you must be baptized to be born again. Otherwise, you Mm -hmm. cannot enter the kingdom of God. You have to actually go through the physical rite of baptism. So if you die without baptism, um, along with the idea of you die without professing the name of Jesus, then you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. What's your response to that? Well, um, that's a another genuine principle, but it's also talking about the normative or ordinary way that people get saved. It's not, however, an absolute principle, and we can also show that from Scripture, because if you go to Acts chapter 10, uh, God indicate the Luke indicates God's view of the Roman centurion Cornelius that he's a righteous man and because he's a righteous man he's already righteous because he's a righteous man he sends Peter to preach the gospel to him and Peter preaches the gospel to Cornelius and his household and they accept the gospel and the Holy Spirit comes down on them and Peter sees that the Holy Spirit has come, come down on them these people are clearly already in a state of salvation and it's on that basis that Peter says how can we forbid them water and then he baptizes them. So this is this is an exceptional circumstance. It's not what normally happens. Normally you receive the Holy Spirit through baptism. But this shows that, as St. Augustine said, we are bound by the sacraments, but God is not. He can give his grace to anybody. So by that, um, from that vantage point, or from because of that premise that God can, you know, God's supernatural graces can work any way that he pleases. And we know the order that his grace works within the church through the sacraments, but that he can do whatever he pleases. He's God. What does that mean then for people who are, you know, saying, well, I'm going to just live a good life. I'm going to try to be a good person. All this religious stuff is kind of intense and, you know, very uh, warring. Everyone's fighting about it. And, you know, the Catholic Church has all these rules, uh, many I don't even understand. And so I'm going to just be a good person. And I have a personal relationship with God. I have a spiritual connection. And I'm just going to do my best to be a good person. And I think that'll get me to heaven. Well, there are a few things to say there. One is that the Catholic Church has way fewer rules than people imagine. I mean, the Catholic Church has fewer rules than the United States does. But, I mean, you look at the size of American law codes, and they're massive. So it's easier to be a Catholic than to be an American, if you want to be a good Catholic or a good American. Um, And frankly, that, oh, you've got so many rules. Well, really, we don't. That's kind of a dodge to evade the question, to evade the issue. Um, But if someone says, well, I'm kind of flummoxed or baffled, you know, by what to do religiously, so I'm just going to focus on being good. Well, okay, you can do that, and good luck to you, but you're running a significant risk here Mm -hmm. because the fact we're even talking about this means that you've, you've got some interest in religion. And if you've got interest in religion, which deals with the two most important subjects in life, 
God and the afterlife. Well, you're going to be you're going to be spending your afterlife with or without God. And so you really want to have an inf- you really want to have an informed position on this. So if you just decide, well, I'm just going to slack off, I'm just going to be lazy and not look into this. You're taking a risk. What I would counsel anyone to do is, you know, God is the most important. He's infinite. So he's the most important subject there is. Second to that is your infinite afterlife. You really want to get those two issues sorted out before you're confronted with God in the afterlife. So I think you need to devote enough study to this to actually figure out what's going on and what you need to do. Well, I think that's why our Lord preaches so much, you know, in the Gospels about the you know worldliness and getting caught up and worried mm-hmm. about the world what we will eat what we will drink what we will wear and how if we're too focused on the material you know all of mm-hmm. these worries you know we are like the plant that doesn't take root that will get mm-hmm. eaten up by the weeds and then you know we have no we can't bear fruit of course if we're eaten up by the weeds and we might even you know forfeit our soul that's how serious mm-hmm. this is so yeah. what would be your what would be your general you know maybe advice or encouragement, especially for listeners who maybe they're, you know, they're on their faith journey, they're trying to develop their faith, but they have friends, family, and they're trying to like, you know, not be a crazy person, but wake up family members who maybe are not taking this seriously. They, they're they trying to be good people and mm-hmm. maybe they're really good people, right? Some mm-hmm. of these, you know, pay, the moral pagans are sometimes more moral than some of the Christians, right? And so they're mm-hmm. just good people trying to live good lives, but they're not spiritually questioning or awake and so maybe they you know their friends or family struggle with how to even evangelize them i would say that um there are a few things here it's it first is it's a difficult thing to evangelize your own family jesus Mm -hmm. himself said that a prophet has no honor in his own country Mm -hmm. and among his own family and so you can you can evangelize your family in an aggressive way, but they're going to be thinking, you know, if they're your parents, they're going to be thinking, I changed your diapers. Who are who are you? you have been around as long as me. Who are you to tell me all this stuff? And if they're your your siblings, they're going to be thinking, I remember when you stole my favorite toy. And who are you to tell me all about this stuff? Why are you getting all holy all of a sudden? So you've got an inbuilt human reaction that you have to deal with. And that means, I think, a few things. One of them, now, it sometimes works out where people evangelize their families. They're very direct. They're very blunt. And it works. And that's great. And I'm not saying don't try that. But if you do try that and you don't get anywhere then you need to back off. And instead, you need to focus on living a good Christian life and showing them the difference that Mm -hmm. being a Christian has made in your life. This is something that St. Peter talks about in his letters, where he's envisioning the circumstance of a Christian woman who's married to a pagan man. You know, they were both pagans at the time they were married, but now the woman has become Christian, and that's the way it often was. You know, many of the earliest converts were women. But then they've got this pagan husband, and Peter talks about how the woman should focus on living a Christian life and evangelizing through the way she lives so that her husband can be one to Christ without words. And if you can use words with your family, that's great. But if you can't use words with your family, if you find out that's counterproductive, then you want to live a good Christian life. You want to mention God. Sometimes you want to show the difference he makes in your life, but you don't want to press too hard. Ultimately, you still want to pray for them and you want to look for opportunities to discuss religious matters with them. Um, You want to be as prepared as you can. You know, another thing Peter says is always be ready to give an answer to others for the hope that is in you, the hope in Christ. So you want to you want to study enough to be prepared to give a basic account of your Christian belief and why you believe it. You want a, at least a little exposure to evangelization and apologetics and be ready to do that and even be eager to do that. Just don't be so eager that it becomes counterproductive. And as always, as St. Paul says, you want to share the truth in love. Don't talk down to people. Don't condemn them. Be a loving person and talk about how great it is to have hope and joy and love and forgiveness from God. 
What is the best answer, the best way to answer the question, uh, the scenario of in heaven, there will be going to have your evangelicals in heaven. You're going to have uh, maybe people who practice the Muslim faith or or Hindu or people that had no faith at all. You know, they were just passionate about whatever they were passionate about that, you know, ultimately was not in conflict with the true the true God, but they were in their own way seeking him as best they could. Mm-hmm. How can that be that those kinds of people may be in heaven? Well, uh, so in heaven, we're going to know the truth. And so it doesn't matter what partial presentation of the truth you had in life. When we actually get there, uh, you know, God, if we've died in God's friendship and we go to heaven, he's going to reveal to us the truth, including about the Christian faith. And uh, actually, I'm hoping he's going to reveal the truth about a lot of mysteries to us. I'm all into mysteries. <laughs> but when we get and is there... And that the personal, is that the personal judgment where that happens when you're, 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 you give your account on a personal level and then you also... You get the full truth in a you know in a moment of incredible the, illumination, or what does that look that, like? That hadn't been determined, mm. and that's something the church doesn't have a teaching on of exactly when we get this in what sequence. Um, there is some evidence from near death experience that par- experiences that parapsychological researchers have studied, where someone comes back and said it was amazing. I I knew everything. I knew all I had to think about was a subject, and then suddenly I know the answers. I just can't remember any of it now. I wasn't allowed to bring that information back to this life. Wow. So, you know, it, it could be very quick that they get this truth. But what we can say with confidence is in heaven, we will have the truth. And so um, just to tie up the answer to your question, um, as a Catholic, I'm, I say, well, the Catholic faith is true. So no matter what people were in this life, no matter what partial version of the truth they had when they were alive, they're going to have the full Catholic truth in heaven, and so we'll all be Catholics. So what is then uh, ultimately the church's teachings on how one is saved? I know you know one is saved through Jesus Christ, but mm-hmm. if you don't fully understand that, you're not, you know, let's say you're not baptized, you're confirmed, how is it possible that you may still be saved? So we're talking exceptional cases here now, not ordinary cases. So what that does, what that means, the way the question's been posed, is we need to look at what are the minimal conditions for salvation. The minimal condition for salvation is love. This is something that uh, John indicates where he says, you know, God is love, and anyone who dwells in God has love, and God dwells in him. So if you have love, you are, I mean, in supernatural love, not just I love pizza or mm-hmm. I love my brother because he loves me. That's, you know, Jesus says, if you only greet your brothers, don't don't the Gentiles do that. You need to be have God's supernatural love, which ideally involves an awareness of God himself as the source of infinite goodness. It may not in your case, if you're poorly catechized and educated, but ideally it includes knowledge of God. And if you love God, and by extension, love your neighbor, then you are in a state of grace. St. Paul highlights an additional element, which is faith. Um, because in the, in, in the ideal and in the normal situation, you need conscious faith in Jesus Christ. And so the way St. Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 13 is, you know, even if I have faith strong enough to move mountains, which is really strong faith, but I don't have love, he says that won't benefit me. Um, what we need, he says in Galatians 5, is faith working through love or faith that works through love. And so the absolute minimum is supernatural love which means disinterested love, not loving because I get a benefit out of it, but loving because God is awesome and other people need to be helped and stuff like that. If it's, if it's, if it's, a, if it's supernatural love, you are in a state of grace. The normal way that manifests is through conscious faith in Jesus Christ. But those are the fundamental minimal principles in answer to this question. Ordinarily, you need to re- consciously repent of your sins. You need to consciously embrace the faith of Jesus Christ. You need to be baptized, and you need to be baptized in Jesus' church, which is the Catholic Church. Thank you, Jimmy. So much good stuff, and I know uh, we could talk about so many more topics, so we've got to have you back on 
because we regularly address uh, these issues on the show and we got to have you in studio too. Thanks for doing this last minute from your, your post. Where can people find your work, Jimmy? Well, I work for Catholic Answers, and our website is catholic.com, because it was the 1990s, and we thought Great. ahead. Um, also, my personal website is jimmyaken.com. All you got to do to find it is spell my name correctly. Jimmy is J-I-M-M-Y. Aiken is so easy. It's just four letters, exactly like it sounds, A-K-I-N. <laughs> There are no E's, T's, or S's in a kin. So jimmyakin.com is sort of my online hub. And you can also check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com slash jimmyakin, where I have new videos coming out every day. Amazing. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Thanks for joining the podcast. My pleasure. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the world's leading Catholic network, reaching millions with the truth about the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com. And before we go, just one more reminder that if you like what you've watched, you can help me out by liking, commenting, and especially by subscribing. I'm trying to grow my channel, and I'd really appreciate your help. Thank you, and God bless you.